Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Maribi Perdomo Cava, and I want to welcome you to the sustainability space. The sustainability space is a series of virtual discussion based events for students in Columbia University's sustainability programs, particularly with the Earth Institute. The sustainability space series started in the fall of 2020 and has become part of our virtual event offerings. The series is hosted by faculty, in this case by Tom Abdallah, and student group leaders. And the presentations and discussions explore a variety of critical topics related to sustainability. Today's topic is sustainable mass transit and will feature Professor Thomas Abdel. Tom. Tom is the Deputy Vice President and Chief Environmental Engineer for the MTA New York City Transit. He's responsible to providing expert environmental engineering services to MTA's construction and development agency. Tom is a professor in Columbia's Sustainability Management Program, also known as the SUMA Program, and the school of, in the School of Professional Studies and is a faculty advisor for the Integrative Capstone Workshop. Tom is also the author of the book, Sustainable Mass Transit, Challenges and Opportunities in Urban Public Transportation, which was published by Elsevier in 2017. Without further ado, Tom Abdallah. Thank you very much, Marivi. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, again, my name is Tom Abdallah. I'm with uh, uh, Columbia University. Uh, and also the MTA, it's uh, my main job. Um, I started with the uh, MTA in 1987 as an assistant environmental engineer and uh, became the chief environmental engineer in 2004. I also became the deputy vice president about four or five years ago. Uh, currently, I'm actually with the newest uh, MTA agency called Construction and Development. Um, I enjoyed working with the transit since uh, I started. Um, one of the things that I enjoyed doing is uh, writing and talking about my projects uh, and then presenting them um, and learning uh, through uh, back and uh, interactive, uh, uh, you know, with, with people about understanding environmental engineering, uh, talking about sustainability. Um, and then I started, uh, being kind of the sustainable champion uh, for MTA, um, one of them, uh, I, I could say. Uh, I enjoyed uh, being the out front person uh, for sustainable issues uh, for a good long time. And then um, I started also branching out doing what I used to call guest lecturing. Um, I would uh, speak with uh, college students, uh, graduate students, uh, and even high school students. Uh, so I started to you know, talk about sustainable projects and sustainability. Uh, and then I was very fortunate uh, to be asked by uh, Columbia University in 2013 uh, to become a professor uh, and join uh, an immense faculty led by Professor Steve Cohn. I'd always uh, been a big fan of Professor Cohn's and uh, actually read his book in 2012, I think, 2013, a little bit before I became a professor, his, his book was called Sustainability Management, which uh, is uh, the program that I'm part of, the Sustainability, Sustainability Management Program, graduate program. And uh, I, I was inspired uh, by all of the faculty and the students at Columbia University uh, through my work in the uh, Capstone uh, Workshop. And in 2016, I I was actually approached by Elsevier Publishing, uh, and they actually sent me a, an email if uh, I knew any environmental experts. And I actually responded back, "Yes, me." Um, and you know, they they said, "Would you be interested in, in writing a book?" And I had always thought about writing a book because I always wrote about my projects. I always did papers about the kind of projects I worked on, and um, so I said, "Sure." And lucky, 2017, I was able to publish the book, Sustainable Mass Transit. So I work with the MTA, or I have worked with the MTA since uh, uh, 1987. Uh, and generally, I work on uh, uh, trains and buses. And that's really the focus of my book. But obviously, there's more, um, you know, uh, mass transit ferries and, and bikes and, and even pedestrian travel. But we, today, we're going to concentrate on uh, mass transit. Um, that I'm much more familiar with, and that's really 
um, the subject of, of my book, Sustainable Mass Transit. But before we do that, we'll get into a little bit about the subway and train and, and bus infrastructure. So um, most people, when they think of mass transit, they think of the uh, underground subway tunnel. And in New York City, we have over 350 miles of underground subway tunnel in, in the city below um, the, uh, the four boroughs, uh, Staten Island has an above ground system. We also have above ground um, entrances and exits. We have underground stations. This is the Whitehall Street station, um, which I haven't used in a year. Uh, I've been working from home uh, as a lot of people have, uh, but this is the, uh, the, the underground station. Right above it is uh, where I work on an everyday basis uh, to Broadway at the lower tip of Manhattan. But the train does come from below ground to above ground. Uh, in fact, we have uh, over 70 miles of uh, above elevated track that uh, travels above the roadways. Uh, we also have above ground stations. This is the 18th Avenue station in Brooklyn. It's actually the station uh, closest to where I live uh, in the, back to the Tiger Heights, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Also transit travels uh, at what we call uh, at grade or slightly below grade. Um, we have uh, several uh, track. Uh, I like to show this photo for a couple of reasons. It shows the proximity of our transit system to the uh, public where people live. Um, and also uh, I like to show this because it shows that we, especially in the outside uh, transit system, we have to deal with all uh, four of the seasons. Uh, obviously this one is fall. And as you can see, the leaves put uh, uh, that are falling on the track potentially could have a problem um, with the tr with the wheels. Uh, when the leaves get on the wheels, uh, between on the track, between the wheels, it could create what's called flat spots. And that's where so you get some excess noise uh, from the, the train. So uh, dealing with the, 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 the seasons uh, is, a, is, a, uh, is a challenge. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, this is what today may look like uh, out there at the Franklin Avenue shuttle. Uh, of course, we have to uh, worry about snow and, and specifically ice forming. So there's a lot of uh, maintenance in the operations of, of transit system to make sure that it's uh, safe and reliable and it, it still runs. There's also transit infrastructure uh, adjacent to um, the sea, the rivers. This is, uh, as we go up north, this is the Metro North stations, uh, two Metro North stations, which are quite adjacent to the Hudson River. So we have to worry about uh, potential flooding and of course, with climate change and sea level rise. We also have transit infrastructure that goes over the, uh, the sea, over the water. Um, this is the Jamaica Swing Bridge, the A train uh, going down to uh, uh, past the JFK airport. Uh, this bridge actually doesn't go up or down to allow maritime traffic to uh, travel, it actually swings. So when the uh, boats with the high masts come in, uh, the, 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 the train, infrastructure actually swings to allow the, uh, the boats to, to go free. Okay, uh, there's a lot of uh, transit infrastructure that people uh, are very familiar with. Uh, the sub, you know, the, the stations, the train itself, but there is a lot of infrastructure that supports uh, mass transit. This is a couple of examples. This is the uh, subway storage yards. Uh, this is the Corona shop, uh, Corona storage yard at the the left side. On the right side is a Long Island Railroad a storage yard that oversees, uh, as you can see, the Empire State Building in the background. So there's a lot of real estate uh, that goes with uh, transit that you don't see uh, that we, we have to worry about, we have to maintain, we have to upgrade. Um, let's see, that went too fast. Okay. Um, the, Major transit systems across America are not what we refer to as heavy rail. Uh, it's, it's actually light rail systems that are more prolific in, in America. This is the uh, San Diego light rail system. Uh, this is a, a picture of a European um, Milan. This is a, a electric streetcar. Uh, they call them trams in Europe. Um, I actually, in my book, uh, I distinguish the difference between a light rail system and an electric streetcar. If the uh, train system 
uh, travels on the same road as cars and buses, I refer to that as an electric streetcar. Um, but if, and if the system has its own infrastructure, uh, I refer to it as a light rail system. There's no, there's no law or written rule, but I wrote the book, so I, that's what I put in the book. Um, this is an example of an electric streetcar uh, in Bilbao, Spain. As you can see, it shares the road with the uh, uh, buses um, and, and other cars. Throughout Europe, you know, there's, there's immense mass transit uh, systems that are uh, prevalent in, in almost all cities. And they all have uh, combinations of heavy rail, light rail, and electric streetcars or, or trams. Uh, as far as buses is concerned, um, New York City Transit has uh, over 4,500 buses roaming the streets of New York City. They need to be uh, safe, reliable, and on time. Um, and they also need a home. Uh, when they're not on the road, uh, they need a place to uh, call home. Uh, bus depots also uh, is where the maintenance of the buses take place, uh, fueling, and this is where we also give them a bath. Uh, we give them a shower. We, we uh, put the buses through car washes every day. Um, in addition to a beautiful appearance, it's also a maintenance issue. You know, you the buses travel throughout the day and there's certain grime build up and uh, pro pro protecting the engines and systems from that grime, uh, a good, uh, you know, shower uh, gets rid of that. So it, it, when those little pieces of dirt and grime get into the system, uh, it, it increases the uh, issues with maintenance. So this is a typical um, traffic view every day. Uh, in New York City. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a lot of cars in traffic. Um, and uh, I look at this photo and, and I see that a lot of uh, anyone in those cars could easily fit in those in the train uh, that you see there. So mass transit is, in my view, the most sustainable uh, solution a city can employ to reduce uh, pollution from emissions from the back uh, of, a, of a car. Uh, and greenhouse gases. Uh, so this is where a city can really uh, be um, proactive in removing you know, cars from the road um, and put people in multi-passenger vehicles. Um, and New York City uh, moves almost uh, 6 million people six in the heyday uh, and, uh, by train and, and almost 2 million by bus. Uh, so could you imagine if we didn't have the transit system in New York City, everybody would be on the road and all day, be immense pollution and uh, actually wouldn't, wouldn't work. New York City is what it is because of the transit system. So mass transit is inherently sustainable, but what I've done over my career is, is make it more sustainable. I've been in the environmental engineering uh, field for 34 years uh, this April. Uh, at, at, at MTA, and th that's what I've done uh, throughout my career is uh, do my best to uh, minimize uh, environmental impacts and make the transit systems, both the trains and buses, uh, more sustainable. Uh, so in my book, I talk about sustainable solutions, um, and throughout this presentation, we'll, we're going to get some examples of, of these. Uh, the the number one um, sustainability element in a train system uh, at this moment is this, uh, something called regenerative braking. Um, so when the when the train um, wants to move forward, the motor person uh, demands energy from the uh, the third rail of the uh, of the transit system, and that's where the electricity comes into the train to to move the train. Under the premise of regenerative braking, when the train slows down, what happens is the polarity of the motor is reversed and it becomes a generator. So as the train is slowing down, it puts energy back into the third rail. Now, in order for that to be usable, there has to be a train demanding energy somewhere down the line. And as you can see in this photo, um, I actually, I like this photo for a couple of reasons. One, it shows that the train is, uh, that particular train is on all three tracks of, uh, of the system at the, at the same time. Um, it's a, you know, train, train travel is, is a choreography. Uh, you see those little red lights, those little signals, uh, those, those are uh, helping with the, 
the movement of the trains. We have 26 lines, so we have trains moving from uh, line to line um, that sh they share the line from local tracks to express tracks. So just from an artistic uh, point of view, I love this shot. But as you can see, in the back of the train is another train. So uh, as this train slows down and regenerative braking goes back into the third rail, uh, a train directly behind or in front who's actually demanding energy can actually make uh, utilize that energy as opposed to you know uh, saving um, uh, energy uh, for the travel. Um, now the important part is that there has to be another train that accepts the regen. Uh, that's what it's called. It's called regen. Now, oftentimes that's not the case. There isn't a train behind it. Rush hour is probably not a problem. Uh, in non-rush hours, that's where it gets a little tricky. Um, so some transit agencies, and, and, I, and I, I say some because my book is not, I'm going to be talking in, in, in terms of, of MTA New York City Transit because that's where I work. But actually, my book is about transit systems in all across the United States of America. And other transit agencies such as Philadelphia, uh, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, Washington, D.C., um, they have all employed or, or some most of those have all employed regenerative braking, but also, uh, in addition, energy storage. So as you see that right there on the right side of that shot, um, there is a, a big sort of a, an abandoned uh, a building um, there. And if that was a big, large battery. Uh, instead of the regen going back into the third rail to be utilized by a, uh, another train, um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the energy could go into a battery, a big, large battery. And uh, then the next train coming down could actually use the, the energy from the battery. Um, again, we're working on that. Uh, we have a, a, a plans at MTA to, to employ that. So big... Uh, um, Energy store, uh, energy uh, sustainable solution is regenerative braking. That's also the same theory with the electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle. When the when the vehicle, the electric vehicle slows down, uh, again the uh, regenerative braking uh, allows energy to go into the uh, battery of the electric vehicle. So uh, this is the main uh, elevators also use a form of regenerative braking as well. So it's a big uh, future. Well present and you know when it gets more um you know is more understanding about it uh and more useful it is actually a sustainable solution that can save energy uh you remember that shot from bilbao spain also they have a small transit system in bilbao and they actually designed their regenerative braking to go back into their power grid so the train system in in bilbao spain actually uh this uh, regenerative braking goes actually back into their power grid. So they get a very good efficiency with their regenerative braking. Um, I'm also gonna show how renewable energy has uh, infiltrated mass transit systems, green infrastructure, green roofs, air pollution control. Um, the uh, transit agencies across the country have embraced lead buildings. Um, there is a lot of uh, facilities and, and, and or buildings. Uh, and uh, many of the agencies have utilized the LEED uh, system in order to become uh, sustainable. Um, there's an awful lot of recycling. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, natural lighting uh, is probably one of the most practical, sustainable solutions that anyone can employ uh, because you can use free energy from the sun. I'll show some examples of that. And also uh, LEDs, light emitting diodes. This is a, a very practical sustainability solution. You see those signal lights there. Um, those are being, and you also on the train, you see some examples of LEDs. LEDs uh, last longer and they don't give off uh, heat. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive than the traditional incandescent or indoor fluorescent lighting, but actually in the long run, you'll save uh, money because you're gonna be using the LED lights uh, a little much longer. So in my book, I've actually separated it into chapters. Um, now I wrote the book in a linear fashion. So if you, if you do decide to you know, buy the book or you have the book, you can read it uh, from start to finish, but I've actually created you know, chapter by chapter so that if, if you wanna go right to 
a specific chapter, they actually work uh, on their own as a, as a singular chapter. Um, that can be, you know, uh, if you don't want to start from the beginning. But, you know, going through the book, I talk about in the first chapter why mass transit is the most sustainable solution for cities to employ. I talk about the infrastructure facilities and vehicles as part of mass transit, uh, including the history of mass transit, which actually uh, goes back to the horse and buggy. Uh, in New York City, in the, you know, before the turn of the century, when, when they had uh, all the transit lines that you see or original lines that uh, a horse, horse-drawn carriages would move people back and forth. And in New York City, uh, actually, for the first time, uh, rail was utilized in the streets. Uh, so steel rail from the carriage uh, with the steel rail that is implanted into the ground created an ease for the horses to move uh, the, the carriages and move people back and forth. So it's the first, um, you know, technically the first uh, mass transit infrastructure uh, happened uh, on Broadway and uh, Chamber Street, I believe. Um, energy is a big part of mass transit. Uh, we use a lot of electricity, obviously, to run trains. We use a lot of fuel, diesel, natural gas to, uh, to run buses. Um, and it's a big business. Uh, energy uh, and transportation are linked together. Energy, transportation, buildings, they're all linked together. Uh, transportation can't happen without energy. Uh, and energy can't happen without some form of transportation as well. Uh, and of course, buildings require uh, energy, and uh, and to get to buildings requires transportation. So those are the big three. Um, now, getting into the the heart of the book, I talk about the sustainability and train rail systems, uh, and then the uh, transit uh, sustainable elements uh, for public bus networks. Um, I have a chapter in there called Future Challenges. What I think um, the, the future holds. What what solutions? What alternative methods of of uh, implementation can be put into uh, transit uh, infrastructure to be more sustainable. Um, and kind of my job uh, over the uh, chapters eight and nine is really what I've been doing uh, in, in my job, uh, environmental mitigation of construction projects and environmental management systems. Um, and environmental management systems uh, is the framework of how you do uh, environmental work to uh, increase continuous improvement. And then the final chapter is just really a recap of, of everything. Um, and a, a thing I want to talk about a little bit, I'll get to that in a little bit, is uh, case studies. Um, I, you know, I was reading uh, several uh, textbooks uh, in my life. I, I noticed that, you know, people would, you know, include one or two uh, case studies. But in the case of, of sustainable mass transit, I just felt that wasn't enough. So it's actually almost 20 case studies, uh, smaller case studies, but uh, really good examples from uh, not only America, but Canada, uh, China, Mexico. Uh, I, could have, I could have added uh, hundreds of, of case studies. Um, I also included a glossary with anachronisms uh, and, and, and photos as well. Now, uh, my book is not uh, full of, uh, of any kinds of, of graphs and, and, and tables and stuff like that. Uh, it just, it's all it's mostly pros uh, coming from what I know, uh, but I did want to throw a few statistics in there, and specifically um, this one. Uh, this uh, graph that you see is the, uh, the diesel usage of public buses. Um, more people in America use bus systems than transit train systems. There, as I mentioned, there are several big cities that have uh, mass transit, heavy mass transit. Uh, a lot of other big cities, Portland and Seattle and, and, and Dallas and, and, and other places have uh, what's called the light rail systems, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and that there's not a lot of them because everybody, every city, every town, every village, every state has bus systems. So in fact, across America, more commuters use public buses. So in the, in the year prior to 2000, the bus systems were looking at ways to reduce uh, emissions uh, began with uh, some uses of uh, compressed natural gas, uh, which at least compared to diesel um, is a, a much cleaner energy to use. Uh, the, my uh, rule of thumb is uh, if you're looking at natural gas, gasoline, diesel, and coal, 
uh, you can figure out which is the dirtiest by how many carbon atoms that they have that are problematic in the incomplete combustion uh, processes, which is really where a lot of energy is derived from. Um, so for instance, if you're using natural gas, uh, methane, uh, that's one carbon atom, as you get to octane uh, gasoline, that's eight, so it gets dirtier. Uh, diesel has somewhere between 10 and 15 carbon atoms. Um, uh, coal has, you know, from 35 carbon atoms, you know, and on up. And that's what makes it the most, the dirtiest of the, uh, the fossil fuels that we, we need to get away from. Um, there's many uh, problems with coal. There's no such thing as clean coal. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. There just isn't. I mean, you could take the impurities out. Um, you can do a lot of things to minimize uh, the emissions. But uh, in fact, the worst part about coal is not necessarily, even if you took out all the impurities and you had a, a total complete combustion without any uh, particles in the atmosphere, actually mining coal is the worst part of, of coal. Um, and, you know, miners who are, you know, subject to uh, black lung uh, and, and cancer as they do this. It's a very dirty job. We need to get rid of that uh, completely. Um, but if you look at the public bus system, uh, prior to 2000, uh, we started to use a combination of compressed natural gas for buses and uh, hybrid buses. Uh, 1996, MTA had 10 hybrid buses. In fact, it, it began the movement of hybrid vehicles in the mid 90s. Everyone came to study our hybrid buses uh, in the uh, 1996 to the year 2000. And then almost overnight, um, you know, not only buses became hybrid, but most vehicles, most uh, 1996, there were two vehicles that I was aware of, the, the, uh, the Prius that had a you know, hybrid uh, system and the Honda Civic. Uh, but, you know, around 2000, all uh, General Motors and, and, uh, and Audi and, and BMW, they all came out with a, a version of hybrid. And of course, now we're moving toward electric vehicles. So just looking at the statistic, uh, which I discovered was that between the year 2000 and 2013, the, the amount of diesel fuel used by public buses went down from 635 to 428 millions of gallons. That's almost one third a reduction in, in diesel fuel usage. Um, so that's a, that was a great accomplishment. Now, the thing was that made it even more uh, you know, amazing was that during that period of time, they never missed a beat. They segued into uh, more sustainable uh, outcomes. But the fact is, during that same period of time, the amount of commuters, bus commuters in America actually went up. So we're talking about sustainability management. That's an absolute amazing achievement to um, you know, reduce your emissions while your business was still uh, moving up. Now you see that little bump up there in 2008 and it comes down and it goes back up again. Um, historically, uh, commuters, uh, the amount of commuters are uh, sort of uh, in relationships to jobs. Um, so and if you, you know, recall in 2008 is when the economy took a little bit of a downturn. Um, and so when, when the economy goes down, there's not enough jobs, then commuters uh, system, you know, get less riders. Uh, but then it's, it's picking back up. I mean, obviously this past year has been, you know, <laughs> a problem uh, as far as, uh, you know, ridership is concerned, but we're hoping to get back to normal uh, very quickly, I hope. Um, anyway, this is the list of case studies that I did. Again, I could have uh, spent the whole book on just case studies, but, um, uh, starting from left to right, uh, actually an agency that has actually done an amazing job of being sustainable, you probably wouldn't think it, is Los Angeles. Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit Authority has, has an amazing track record of sustainability. Um, and they don't, obviously, you know, it's more of a car centric, California is more car centric, but they actually, in Los Angeles and San Francisco, uh, their um, transit systems are an amazing um, examples of, of sustainability. So I wrote uh, uh, case studies about those. Um, also, there are a lot of uh, the bus systems in, in California uh, that are, uh, you know, some are dedicated to natural gas, but not fracked natural gas, un, unfracked natural gas, uh, perhaps uh, gas that is derived from landfills. You can get an awful lot of methane from the, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, years and years and years of, of, of dumping uh, 
you know, garbage into landfills, it creates uh, methane uh, that you can extract. Uh, so a lot of the California agencies are using that, but also electric buses. Um, electric buses are really prolific in, uh, in California. Uh, some even having total fleets uh, or at least goals to have total fleets, fleets of uh, electric um, uh, buses. Um, Portland, uh, Seattle, Portland employs a, a great regenerative braking system. Uh, Seattle, uh, Portland and Seattle are very sustainable cities, so it's not a surprise that their transit systems would be very sustainable. Now, coming over to the right side, um, you know, one of my favorite uh, sustainability uh, projects is uh, the Kansas City Streetcar. Um, and in addition to uh, being a sustainable transit system that utilized a lot of recycled metals in their, in their uh, design and construction. Uh, one thing I really enjoy reading about in the Kansas City streetcars, it's actually free. Uh, mass transit in Kansas City is, is free. Uh, we have actually some examples of free transportation systems. Uh, the Staten Island Ferry is, uh, is free. Uh, so there are some, in the Chicago, uh, uh, the loop, uh, well, maybe it's not Chicago, Portland. Portland has a similar loop system that, that Chicago has. And uh, if you get on the tra train in Portland, it actually um, is free as well at that particular time. Um, but of course, uh, and you see uh, several um, you know, international agencies that I've, I've looked at, um, including Canada, uh, Mexico City, uh, bus rapid transit is big in Mexico City. But they had actually a, an emergency decade ago. Um, Mexico City actually is a high altitude, but it actually sits in a bowl. So they had a lot of traffic issues. So uh, they were having a, a pollution emergencies and, and they, they started to employ a bus rapid transit, which is a dedicated infrastructure for buses. Um, we don't yet have that in New York City. We have what's called select uh, bus service. It's similar. Uh, the bus rapid transit runs on a prioritized signaling basis. So in other words, if the bus is, is riding uh, and it goes um, toward a red light or at least toward a green light, the, uh, the bus driver can actually uh, press a button and, and, and hold the light green so it can actually go uh, with a priority. Wouldn't you like that on your, in your car? Um, so uh, we have a select bus service, which means it's, it's similar, but it does not exactly bus rapid transit because it doesn't have its own infrastructure. People could actually drive on the, uh, the they're not supposed to, but they, they can actually move their cars, you know, in the lanes that the select bus service has. So um, we are working uh, uh, on projects, you know, potentially in Staten Island uh, for bus rapid transit. Um, so uh, a couple of others, uh, me, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, case studies down below, uh, they're actually using uh, wireless light rail systems. You remember that shot of the Milan, uh, you know, train light rail, you saw those overhead wires where the energy comes back and forth, uh, really, you know, actually in front of incredible, you know, 12th, 13th century architecture. So um, it'd be nice if uh, the transit system and running with the same, you know, uh, uh, you know, system as a, as a hybrid where uh, it's, a, it's a light rail system, but it's actually running on a, on a battery. Uh, so those are the uh, case studies, but actually, you know, since uh, I'm part of the MTA, uh, I, I will talk about some of the projects that I've worked on. Um, the uh, earliest one, uh, really great project that we worked on is uh, the Stillwell Terminal in Brooklyn, uh, you know, where I live. Uh, this, this is the largest above ground subway, uh, excuse me, a train terminal in the Northeast. And its roof is made up of a thin film solar encased in two planes of glass. So that, that rooftop that you see is got thin film solar, which generates uh, electricity from the sun. Now, unfortunately, well, let me start off with, this was the largest producing uh, solar facility in New York City until Superstorm Sandy came along and uh, there was about eight to 12 feet of water in this uh, section of Brooklyn uh, during uh, her, her Superstorm Sandy. And unfortunately, the electricity that we, uh, the electrical equipment that we use to, um, uh, to, to capture the energy uh, was in the basement of this uh, facility. So we had to uh, move that equipment up. But we've actually um, 
not yet resurrected it completely. Uh, and right now we're actually looking at, at, at attaching a large battery. So, and I, and I think that um, the future of, uh, of sustainability um, is renewable energy. Now, again, there's no one solution for sustainability and, and I'll show you many, many examples, but one of the largest uh, combinations of, of solutions is renewable energy with energy storage. Uh, it, you know, as we've heard, you know, the, the, uh, the wind turbines in, in Texas froze and, um, you know, you, the, uh, it's not always sunny for solar panels, but however, if the energy um, is stored in a, in a, in a battery and the, that, that, those solutions exist. Um, they just have to be refined and, and have to be implemented. Uh, one of the, the things that engineers do is engineers need to look at the uh, existing uh, advanced technologies and then implement them in uh, major construction projects. And it's kind of what, what we've done. So we're looking at uh, um, creating a, a, a energy storage system combined with the renewable energy. Uh, but in the meantime, the, the good news is that the, uh, the roof still works. It still protects people from the elements such as rain and snow. And also, as you can see, uh, this particular architecture of this particular station allows natural lighting to uh, reduce the amount of artificial lighting that we require during the daytime. So while we're uh, you know, rehabilitating uh, the system from a, a sustainability and the solar panel point of view, it still, it still works. Uh, it's called building integrated uh, solar panels. Uh, we also have solar panels. This is a, a station in uh, Queens, Jackson Heights, Queens. Again, thin film solar uh, that utilize on the canopy uh, of this particular station. If, if you've ever taken the station, you probably can't see it unless you're really looking for it from the opposite side of the, of the platform. But uh, thin film as opposed to thick film, um, it's easier to use. Look at the kind of places you can put it because it's, you know, the ease of, of use. However, the um, thick film, uh, thicker uh, type of solar panels actually create, have a little bit more efficiency because they're thicker. And the whole theory behind the uh, uh, solar panels is it's a uh, semiconductor, uh, the, the, the material. And when the sunshine hits the semiconductor, it excites the electrons and they move. And the, the, that movement of electrons is actually captured in a circuit. And that's what actually, uh, you, how you, you, you utilize electricity. It's all about circuits. Um, so with thin film, there's not as much room for those electrons to move. So you don't have as much efficiency. So you can do a lot more with it, but you don't have as much uh, efficiency as a, as a more traditional. Uh, and I have some examples of that that I can show you. Um, it's a little small example, but it's like kind of a microcosm uh, example of renewable energy. This is a, uh, a small solar panel that's attached to a what, what's called a lubrication house. Now the lubrication house, what happens there is um, when a train is coming toward a curve, uh, now the train wheels, the, excuse me, the track is straight. Right? Excuse me, the wheels of the train are straight always. But the track actually curves around. And that's where you sometimes hear uh, some uh, annoying screeches uh, when the train actually goes around a curve, like that. So uh, what we do is in uh, the case of a curve, what we have is what's called the lubrication. Now, so it puts a little biodegradable grease uh, around the curve so that the train actually lessens, it's not completely zero, but it lessens the screech uh, of course, it has to be lube in the lube house for it to work. But in this case, this particular lube, uh, lube house is uh, utilizing a battery that is being powered by a small solar panel. So it's kind of like a microcosm of, of what I feel is, you know, the future of, uh, of sustainability or one of the future s solutions of sustainability. And it's not, it's not really the future anymore. It's the present. You know, you use uh, renewable energy uh, to to power a battery that, you know, you, you, know, you save, you know, uh, electricity from the grid. Uh, again, th this is a much more traditional, what you may, people may be familiar with a solar panel. This is the uh, solar array on top of the um, uh, Corona maintenance shop in Queens. Uh, this particular shop is located uh, in the uh, Flushing 
it's a Corona shop, but it's actually located in Flushing, Queens. You know, I know that because I see Shea Stadium in the background, uh, which is no longer there. Uh, for those uh, Met fans, uh, you know, who are out there, they will be very familiar with Shea. Uh, if you're a rock and roll fan, you know that that's where the Beatles played in 1964, 1965, ushered in the, the era of a stadium rock concert, which, you know, um, hopefully we get back uh, to being able to go to again. Um, but right now, this, this, uh, the lot there that's empty, that's where uh, the Mets play now at City Field. But the, uh, the maintenance shop is our first uh, LEED uh, certified uh, maintenance shop uh, that we utilized a rating system to order to be more sustainable. You see white roof, which reflects uh, sunshine, the ultraviolet rays of the sun uh, hit the top of the roof. A white roof as uh, compared to a black roof. The black roof will absorb the rays of the sunshine and then the, uh, the surface will radiate uh, waves back into the atmosphere. That's actually what's captured by the greenhouse gas molecules um, that creates the global warming effect. So a white roof, a more reflective roof, actually uh, does not absorb as much of the sunshine and actually puts it back up into the to uh, to the atmosphere as the waves that it came down and is not as uh, is not as bad for the environment. Inside the building, we have uh, natural lighting. We have uh, also natural ventilation. The building is actually uh, angled to take advantage of the natural uh, prevailing direction of the wind uh, so that in the summertime when it gets really hot, uh, louvers on one side of the building open up and allow the, the, the air from the outside to come in. Heat rises. So as it comes in, it moves the air up and out. Louvers on the top side of the building creates a very comfortable um, atmosphere for people to work. This particular facility is one of the best at uh, mean distance between fares. In other words, the trains that are maintained in this particular green building have a better, <coughs> excuse me, record of uh, not breaking down as much. And I attribute it to the work in the green building. This is our first green roof. Um, this particular building, very sustainable. It was built on top of an old platform that looked very similar to the one uh, to the left of this particular building. It's very sustainable. It was actually, um, it utilized the foundation of the old platform, but it also utilized the old columns. It had an old platform that had a, a column and canopy structure similar to what you see there. And those old canopies, those columns were actually utilized to hold up the, uh, the, the roof of the building. And also, we also have another um, example of natural lighting. Now, we want skylights to allow the light in, but we don't um, want the heat that comes with it. So that glass is coated with what's called a low E coating. And that prevents the heat from building up inside of the facility, but allows the light to come through as well. Our big showcase project that I worked on uh, for, for eight years uh, between 20, 2008 and 2016. This is the Mother Clara Hale Bus Depot. This is the, uh, the, the first uh, gold uh, certified uh, lead building for a, a, a inner city bus depot. Um, I'm very happy to say that the Los Angeles Metro also has a gold certified uh, bus depot, uh, but we were about six months or eight months before them. And uh, before you actually begin uh, a lead building or any kind of building. Uh, this was the old building. Um, and uh, the first rule of a lead building is, is to, to utilize, similar to the, um, the building I showed you with our, uh, the green roof uh, before, um, not to demolish as much of the old infrastructure as you can. But in the case of the Mother Cloud uh, Hale uh, bus depot, the building just was not large enough and it was not, didn't have a, a integrity. So we had to demolish it. So we did the next best thing. We recycled it. Uh, we recycled uh, almost 99.54% of the concrete and the steel and any old equipment we took out, we brought to another facility. You want to see that again? A lot of people like that effect. Um, so uh, uh, we did it. We actually were not uh, believed. Uh, so we actually did an audit and, and actually we found out even better 
uh, the old um, concrete was crushed off site and brought back on the site as a foundation. So uh, we, we actually discovered that something that the contractor implemented uh, on their own by utilizing the old uh, concrete uh, as, a, as a foundation for the building. Uh, the building has a, a green roof. It's about the fourth or fifth largest green roof in New York City. Green roofs are fantastic. They uh, provide a layer of protection for the building. They absorb rainwater uh, to prevent flooding. Um, they uh, provide extra layer of insulation for the building. But more importantly, the leaves of the, of the it's not a regular lawn, it's actually an engineered uh, soil. It, it allows uh, void, it has voids uh, to allow the, um, uh, the absorption of, uh, of, of, of rainwater and also, obviously, it absorbs carbon dioxide, which is, of course, important when it comes to uh, climate change and global warming. But the other thing that the green roofs do, when uh, the, the, there's floating uh, particles, uh, specifically from elemental carbon, from the uh, diesel fuel, from trucks and, and, and other uh, you know, vehicles, um, those particles are floating in the atmosphere. Uh, when those particles get very heavy, people with asthma suffer greatly, especially the kids. Sometimes they have to be taken to the hospital. So what a green roof does actually, it absorbs, it, it, when those particles lay and sort of stick to the, the blades of grass of the green roof, they actually then, when it rains, those particles then get you know, absorbed into the soil of the green roof. They actually neutralize um, the uh, particles from the atmosphere. So green roofs do an amazing job in, in you know, all, uh, sustainable ways. Um, where we don't have a green roof, we have a white roof, again, reflecting the sunshine back in the atmosphere. We also collect rainwater uh, where um, the rain hits the, the white part of the roof. Uh, it will go into this 50,000 gallon tank, which is where we utilize, to remember I told you we give uh, buses a shower every day. We use a, a lot of uh, recycled or, or, well, we recycle the water as well, but we use a lot of rainwater from rainwater collection. When the green roof gets overly saturated, it actually drains into those drains as well. So we kind of uh, uh, utilize, uh, you know, additional uh, supply of, uh, of stormwater. It takes the stormwater that would have went into the wastewater treatment system. As opposed to that, we use it to uh, wash the bus. Uh, we don't have solar panels on this building. We have what's called a solar wall. Uh, the solar wall is a very, you know, it's, it's on the southern side of the building. It, uh, it gets, uh, in the winter time, it heats up from the sun. And then we have, you can't see them here, but there's, trust me, <laughs> there are small, tiny little holes in this particular wall. And so when it heats up during the winter, we actually bring air through this uh, solar wall to supplement uh, the uh, heat uh, in, the, in the winter time. Uh, and it, it, it provides a, it's a very practical uh, solution. It you know, provides a little extra energy uh, you know, efficiency. Uh, in the summer, obviously, we don't want that. So we have a bypass um, to make sure that that air doesn't go into the building. Um, and again, uh, LEED, a uh, gold certified uh, building. Uh, very proud of this achievement. Uh, we work with the community. We had a design charrette. We talked to the community about having the most green and clean building ever. And, and we did. We accomplished that. Um, of course, the next uh, phase of sustainability, uh, especially when it comes to buses, is electric buses. Uh, that's the easy part. Having electric buses uh, is, is easy. But what's a little bit more difficult is uh, we need to also implement uh, charging stations, uh, not only in the, in the, in the facilities, but, but in, the, um, in the road so that, uh, you know, if buses need a boost, uh, they can get it. So that's a, one of the reasons why I wrote my book is so that it isn't a one person job. Sustainability is not a one person job. Uh, challenge. It means it's, it's teams of people, but also teams of agencies and public works uh, organizations to get together, uh, you know, in order for us to, you know, implement a full fleet of 4,500 uh, electric buses, we need an awful lot of infrastructure that's just not there yet. So that's the hard part. Yeah. Um, again, talking about uh, environmental management systems, our design and construction uh, unit in New York City Transit has been certified to a system, uh, an EMS uh, international system. I don't have time to go into it, but it's chapter nine if you want to read all about environmental management systems and how it helped us become 
more sustainable, you know, please do. Um, so this is my book, uh, Sustainable Mass Transit. Uh, it is a sustainability book. Uh, if you are not interested in transit, transportation, it doesn't matter because all of the elements that I speak about in the book are, um, you know, uh, really relevant for sustainability professionals to learn. Uh, it's everything I knew at the time. Um, uh, I did uh, have thoughts about writing a, a second book. Uh, it's, it's, it's not as easy. <laughs> it's not, it's hard actually. So one day I would like to, you know, perhaps write a second book uh, uh, for sustainability professionals uh, for, uh, for, you know, to be armed with the information necessary to, uh, to make our earth uh, safer, uh, cleaner, uh, and for future generations to come. So uh, thank you very much. I'll take any questions that you may have. Right. Thank you, Tom. So we have a few questions lined up, but we welcome everyone to send their questions using the Q&A feature. Um, the first question we received was, what are the new federal administration goals for mass transit sustainability? Okay, so um, uh, people may or may not know, uh, transit systems are funded through state and uh, federal uh, programs. Um, so in some cases, in order to get federal funding, uh, you have to be more sustainable, or at least your project has to be uh, more sustainable, or it will have better chance, um, you know, obviously uh, with within state or within federal uh, guidelines, there are many, many transit agencies uh, and not enough dollars to go around. So in order to compete for those dollars, in many cases, like if, if a transit agency wants to buy a bus, you have a better chance of buying a, you know, electric buses, that's what you wish, because that's where you know, the Federal Transit Administration um, uh, they have uh, uh, worked uh, with their grants and not all of them, but a lot of them are tied back to sustainability. So there aren't exactly like specific guidance. I mean, you know, uh, I, I've been around engineering for a long time. My dad was an engineer. Um, and so a lot of the uh, older engineers always told me growing up, we've been doing sustainability for a long, long time. It just, you know, it's, it's built into the codes. Um, but Actually, one of the things about environmental management systems is that you go over and above code. And that's what really what makes it a little bit more sustainable. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question we received is from someone who's not from the United States, so not as familiar with the MTA and how it works in the US. Is sustainability part of the conversation or the way the MTA is trying to convince citizens to use mass transit in New York City? Uh, you know, I would say a little bit, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, you know, you can, uh, if you ride the transit system, you know, we publicize, you know, the, the benefits of mass transit. If you ride the buses, we, we do have, we do a lot of it. Um, maybe not as much as I like hope we would to entice, we're going to have to try everything now, actually. You know, we, again, as I mentioned, you know, prior to 2020, you know, we had you know, up to 6 million, 7 million people riding the train every day. Uh, that has gone down during the pandemic. So uh, we're going to have to use everything. Uh, and that's kind of what I did. It's kind of like I, what I can I do for a living. Uh, I try to influence um, people to use mass transit. I use mass transit. I've actually been using the train since I was 13 years old. I went to uh, Brooklyn Tech uh, High School in, in Brooklyn. So I, I took the R train every day from 95th Street to uh, DeKalb Avenue. Uh, so I've been riding the trains my whole life. It's, it's kind of like what we do in New York City. We ride the trains. I do have a car. Uh, I'm not, you know, I can't, can't say I you know, take the train everywhere. I, you know, when we go shopping, I, I use the car. Uh, but uh, it is a, is a, a low emission car. <laughs> but um, but we, we should do more. I think in Europe, you do, they do a lot more. Um, it's probably where they, you know, the, 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 the genesis of the question is, I remember the first time I landed in, uh, in, in Munich, Germany, 10 years ago big signs about sustainability uh, at that time. Uh, so I think they promote it a little better. Um, you know, we, we, we are sustainable um, and uh, we are also part of a state. Uh, you know, people can have, you know, their opinions about New York State, uh, but it is, you know, along with uh, several other states, one of the more progressive when it comes to sustainability. So we're kind of a, a share, a, you know, a, a, you know, an ideal. Uh, and I think, um, 
I think it, it obviously is, is to me again, you know, it's in the book uh, uh, and I would, you know, it's arguably the best sustainable solution for any city to employ. So I think this is kind of like me, you know, uh, I'm off today. So I, I'm not working for the MCA today. Today I'm on my own, but, but you know, in, in a way, I think these types of things that I do are in fact to try to promote uh, utilizing mass transit on a daily basis, especially for commuters going back and forth to work and school and stuff like that. Thank you, Tom. We have three more questions and we're kind of running short on time. So I'll do them really quickly. Can you share a bit more on the air pollution solutions and strategies implemented by the MTA? Which areas or neighborhoods is this issue mostly prevalent? And what triggers the request to monitor or address air pollution issues? <laughs> okay. That's a long question. We don't have really time to answer it, but I will tell you this, there are you know, numerous environmental justice uh, areas in, in New York City. The Mother Clara Hale bus depot was in the middle of Harlem, a uh, big environmental justice area. Uh, Chinatown is another you know, environmental justice area. When I, when I talk about that, I talk about where it's problems with emissions. And that's a big, it's a big problem. So, so you know, we listen to everyone. We, we try to put in filters, uh, specifically inside bus depots to ensure that you know, we, we try to, you know, filter, uh, you know, particles coming in and out of our system. Um, so we have a transit system everywhere. Every, you know, it's, if we don't have a train, we have a bus line. So we, uh, in the 20 years of sustaining, I guess, you know, my whole career, um, but it's specifically in the 90s when we really started thinking about sustainability, we, we think about everything. What can we do? Green roofs. Uh, we have four green roofs now uh, at Transit, or is it three? Three. Uh, it's East near it. <laughs> the Signal Tower, the uh, Mother Clara Hale, and now we have a bus command center. So we have three. Um, we have four rainwater collection systems uh, on bus depots and maintenance shops. Uh, we use the regenerative braking. We, we try to, uh, you know, again, we, 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 were, we started with the compressed natural gas in the early 90s. Um, but because of the infrastructure changes, we, we, we went to the hybrids. So we're always, we're at the forefront. We're at the forefront of, uh, of sustainability. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we like to spread it around. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, why did you select the station? I remember it had a 74 when, when the question came in. Um, uh, for the solar panels. So what made you decide on that specific station? Okay, so um, sometimes it's just happenstance. Um, you know, we have what's called a 20 year needs uh, program. So it's kind of like we look 20 years into the future and, and okay, what needs to be rehabilitated now? And what can wait five years? What can wait 10? What can wait 15? Uh, unfortunately, most of the projects are in the zero to five need, but we don't always have the the money for that. So. A lot of times, the um, the the, the uh, solution to a specific project is because that project is going into a rehab right now. So, oftentimes, when when I kind of get involved with being sustainable, when a, when something's breaking down and something needs fix, something needs to be fixed, something needs to be uh, taken care of. A station needs rehabilitation. A bus depot needs rehab, or or even in the case of Mother Clara Hale. Uh, demolition and re, uh, re, you know, total reconstruction. So a lot of it is happenstance. We look at all of our projects. Uh, MTA is part of the uh, Smart Energy 2025 program. So we're looking at our, our, our projects in the future, you know, where we can be more sustainable. My staff, uh, who I, you know, I, I really, since I have a minute, I'd love to, you know, if any one of my uh, people at MTA are listening, you know, uh, all my colleagues there, my staff, you know, I can't do any of this without them. Uh, I also want to thank, you know, people at Columbia. Uh, the faculty uh, is amazing. The students are absolutely uh, amazing. They're smart and passionate and, and, and do a lot of, you know, uh, altruistic work. Uh, so I'm very blessed to be part of two major iconic New York City institutions, MTA and, and Columbia. Uh, I'm very proud. Uh, you know, I wrote a, a dedication in the front of the book where I dedicated, you know, I also can't do any of this without my wife uh, and, and my family. Um, my mom and dad, my mom was a New York City school teacher. 
for 25 years. My dad was an engineer. Uh, my father passed away 10 years ago, um, but he was the best engineer I ever met. Um, my mom has been teaching me since I was, well, before I was born, I think. And so I'm a very per lucky person. I was able to follow in both my parents' footsteps as, a, as a, an educator and, and an engineer. So, uh, you know, just hopefully, uh, you know, we get back to normal. I did get my first shot on Sunday, as first dose. So uh, I also encourage people to uh, get vaccinated. I know it's not easy. It's kind of like, you know, in the old days of trying to get concert tickets, you just have to keep refreshing to see if you can get a spot. Uh, but keep doing that and also wear masks uh, and stay six or seven feet away from people um, just for the time being. And hopefully we'll get back to uh, to being uh, uh, normal. And, and I've been, you know, working online, uh, my my students. Uh, but, you know, I'd love to get back into the classroom and back into the to the workforce and, and, and everyone get back to, you know, again, a, as normal a life as we can envision. Right. Thank you so much for joining and please join the other events in the Sustainable Space Series.